Ser utmärkt ut. Det verkar fungera alltihopa här. Fantastiskt. Vad roligt. Hello and most welcome to 1445 of the series. We will continue with the article of Hans Ruin. And we are currently at page 84. Circumcising the word Derrida as a reader of Paul. And I will try during the lecture to maximize the reading volume by moving the microphone. So if I move about, you will know why. <laughs> And this will be around an hour. So after 45 minutes, there will be a discussion and a summary. Let's see where we are time-wise. That will be five past one. Uh, <clears throat> and I will continue on the last paragraph on page 84. And to put you into the questionnaire, we have been discussing difference contradictions and how those two facets of reality are a must for wholeness or permanence I would say also the inability to take indifference and oppositions will inevitably lead to fragmentization and impermanence. It's a sort of, you could say, clinging. And this interesting turn in deconstruction where deconstruction goes into theology is exactly the spot where I will enter now. I will not go deeper into this larger problematic of deconstruction and religion. Which has contributed to changing the shape of the debate, both in theology and in continental philosophy. Making again issues of religion and of faith. Into respectable and urgent topics also for non-believers and I would just comment here this is of course incredibly interesting
it suffices here to be aware of the impact of this intervention. More important for our present purpose is to see that as far as Paul is concerned, Derrida's turn toward religion did not Unlike in the case of Heidegger, led to any explicit attempt to return to Paul. in order to locate more specifically the position and effect of Paul in the topology of Derrida's thinking, we therefore need to look elsewhere. namely to specific themes in his work that carry a Pauline echo. And topology is here immensely important. We have gone into topology of Heidegger. We looked at it when it comes to Merleau-Ponty. It is a certain topology that is having an effect outside what is specifically mentionable, verbal or oral. And understanding the topology is the key to getting a grip to why it is what we 
normal people perceive to be irresolvable contradictions actually are a necessity for continuance and permanence. So it's a good clue there. Hans Ruin doesn't specifically mention topology elsewhere, but still it is very pertinent. It continue it is to such a theme that we shall now turn, namely to the exemplary problem in circumcision. circumcising Paul. The ancient Hebrew word shiboleth literally means river or stream. In most modern languages, it also denotes a token or distinguishing mark. In most modern languages, it also denotes a token or distinguishing mark. This, this secondary meaning has its origin from a story in the book of Judges. Russia, Russia, Russia. Russia. Oh. Ah. Yeah, Russia. This secondary meaning 
has its origin from a story in the book of Judges 12, 6. That recounts how Japheth and the Gileates had encircled their enemies. The Ephraimites along one of the passages across the Jordan River. Hello. In order to pass, everyone was required to say the word Shibulet. The Ephraimites who spoke the same language as their foes could not pronounce it in the same way. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Where is Eres? Ah, see <laughs> How are you? Good to see you, Mariola. I, I saw this and I tell myself that many possibilities has. <laughs> <laughs> Just finished and go again at uh, 8 30 there. Oh, okay, in the night. Will we see you tonight? Yeah, probably. I have early this week. Uh -huh. Until Sunday, so I don't. I come only in, man, in mornings. But okay, for you I will come for a beer. Oh, and I, and I learned that you drink only cola. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's another way to see you. Good to see you, Mariola. <laughs> Sorry about that. The Ephraimites who spoke the same language as their foes could not pronounce it in the same way.
in their mouths or tongues, it came out as sibuleth. Their tongue gave them away, and thus they were killed. All in all, over 40,000, according to judges. The famous story of this brutal event is recalled by Derrida in an essay on another Paul. His friend, the Jewish Romanian German poet, Paul Salam. Entitled Shibboleth for Paul Salam, written in 1984. Salan mentions the word shibboleth in one of his poems. For Derrida, however, the theme and the problem evoked by the story from judges of the lethal password obtains a greater significance as an entrance word. Thank you. 
Not only to Ceylon's poetry, but to the poetic experience and ultimately to the experience of language as such. To have a language is always to be part of a community. and thus to belong to and be open to communication. But it is also, and inversely, to be excluded from community and communication and thus vulnerable. This differentiation takes place not only between different groups, but also between the individual and the community. Language is the expression of an individual experience, which it both preserves and betrays. And I think you can see the connection here to what previously read in 1444, that of opposition and wholeness, the dichotomies by avoiding them 
leads us into fragmentation. But taking them in, they become whole. As you can see here, language both preserves and trace. In this, in his beautiful, beautifully crafted interpretation, Derrida shows to what extent Ceylon was preoccupied with the problem of witnessing, with the date and with the possibility of giving poetic voice to the singular human event and experience. In his beautifully crafted interpretation, Derrida shows to what extent Ceylon was preoccupied with the problem of witnessing with the date and with the possibility of giving voice to the singular human event and experience. And I think this last sentence reread is one of the most important in this part of the article. Remember here, singularity does not defy plurality. It is not in either or. And in this specific human event of Salaam, published in 1984, it is a singular event that depicts, so to speak, a bit exaggerated, all events. From the singular singularity comes universality. That is one of the gifts of bringing in difference and oppositions. It opens up for more, more understanding And this is also very much connected to time. Our regular view of temporality is that there are singular events and they come together, so to speak, to make a row of events. But this is not how things of properly working. 
a singular moment can carry eternity. I recommend in this instance that you remember that temporality takes a big role in sign and sight. It's the most decisive thing not to be ignored. In his reading of Ceylon's often enigmatic poems, which are full of dates and vaguely indicated references to historical events. They come forth not only as ciphers of hidden meanings and experiences to be unpacked by the skilled interpreter. They also bear witness of a more general poetic linguistic predicament as seeking from within the singular individual experience from which they seek to establish an uncertain and incalculable pact with the other Throughout this interpretation, one word and one theme returns repeatedly, circumcision. That is circumcision. Apago, apago 
it is both the first and last word of the texts. Which itself also moves in a kind of circle and circling its theme, tracing and cutting around it. Through its fundamental ambiguity, it is a word and a theme that attracts the critical, philosophical, and also poetic interest of Derrida. In a somewhat later and partly autobiographical text written in the wake of the death of his mother and construed as a long commentary on Saint Augustine. He even declares that circumcision, that's all I ever talked about. That is circumcision, that's all I ever talked about. One need not necessarily take at face value this somewhat hyperbolic confession. But it testifies to the importance of this complex cultural practice
which in his thought works as a symbol for a more general predicament. As has also been pointed out in several recent commentaries. So we hit the five minute mark past one here. And we will continue with the summary here. We're just getting into the interesting part of circumcision. Circumscribing the word, which is also in the very title. I will especially point here to the roundness and the encircling activity. It has a verbal aspect. It is not static. It's a doing. And this is another one of those very important dichotomies between staticness, absolute stillness, something we discussed so many times before, uh, one of the predisposition to have a stain existence. It needs to be absolutely situated in a spot. Previously, we have looked into the known locality of quantum mechanics, which opposes the idea of this localized stillness. Here, the point is taken even further, showing that movement itself is an absolute predisposition for any stillness to be. Once more oppositions take a decisive part in understanding. And the word shibboleth is both a passage that will enable you to enter, but it could also be your demise, the end of your existence. And it's the very same word. So can you see the same word as these two very opposing effects? Shibboleth. This dual nature, as I mentioned when I read the text, does not at any singular instance defy singularity, unity, individuality.
That also comes across uh, <clears throat> when the human event was meant, mentioned here. The singular individual experience. And I would, I think here, most people today believe that a text like the one mentioned here of Shibleth doesn't have the power to be universal, global, circumcising or circumscribing the world, taking all its parts in. But this is exactly what is meant here. The singularity depicts all in space, but also in time. I come to think of William Blake that we mentioned. Oof many, many episodes ago in maybe in the hundreds out in Egvena, that eternity in a moment and the universe in a corn of sand, piece of sand, I think it was. That goes to show that this division or parting of reality into the smaller things of little or non-existence, non-significance, non-extension is always compared to the hugeness of all the universal. This reaches into the camera. And this is smoothed out here. It's shown to be of similar nature. Still opposing, they need to be let to be opposing. They are allowed to be opposing. And by allowing that opposing nature, we oddly, and this is the fantastic news, we also gain universality, globality, and the wholeness. I'll have some look here at. Kala Lundahl, my dear colleague here, writes, we could compare the word shibulet, meaning river, with the Swedish word hö. Foreigners like Ephraimites back then have a difficulty pronouncing this sound. Most definitely it would give them away. They would most probably say sir instead, and they would be marginalized and metaphorically killed. Very good. Fantastic. Yeah, the singular experience reminds me of the paper by Terry Marx Tarlow, who spoke about singularity. It is not the average, yeah, the meridian. 
that determines the whole. Nobody has two and a half children. You have to pick any average family to understand the whole. Yes, definitely, very good. And uh, her, the Swedish word her reminds me of a similar shibulet parallel. Salan was Jewish, a uh, vivid defender of uh, Heidegger, if I don't miss Noam, could be wrong there. But there was a Jewish song in the same period as a little before the Second World War that came into Sweden. And the literal meaning was, for me, you are beautiful. By mir bist du schön. And that got in Swedish, so to speak, misread, most probably intentionally, to bär mer mig till kön. It sounds almost exactly the same, but its meaning is entirely different. And that was used in the Jiddish melody. And it's just a couple of years ago I found that out. The whole song sounds like the original, but the meanings are quite apart. And here you have, in an example, both difference and sameness in one. Celan committed suicide shortly after meeting Heidegger. Well, wow, thank you for the clarification, Caleb. I will remember if he was remaining. I wouldn't venture further in my uh, guesses. Heidegger is dangerous. Very good. Yeah, we have these false friends in all languages, and there are many examples how, for instance, misreadings, as you often call them. But are they proper misreadings or misunderstandings? Do they not cover understanding as well? And that indeed is, I think, especially in the old linguistics, there was a separation. I said the proper meaning, the proper understanding of a word, and the so called misreading. And this is most definitely something that Derrida is, as he said, place with. But he also shows that the very idea of misreading or mishearing could in itself be too limiting, be too cutting off, not allowing for the wholeness of what is said to come through. And I can just mention here, uh, I was approached earlier on here by someone who asked me if I was Russian. Obviously, he's mishearing my English here. I hope it's not that bad for Russian. That is also, it still has meaning for someone, although the meaning is not the egoistically, I would like to have it, but the meaning is global. It goes way further than we normally think. And this is so aptly depicted uh, by Darida in the voice of the friend. Well, I think I finish off here. It was quite interesting. Thank you very much, Kalle, for your interesting things here.
I will have a further look into Ceylon, that open in itself, something very interesting, and get back to something more about him in the next lecture I'm already looking forward to. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone, and participating, and sorry for all problems with the sound. I am working on it. And, uh, hey, Taco Hey Live at is also, well, it's not a misreading, but it's, um, it's a rhyming thing, and rhyme does have that thing in itself. Bye bye, and thank you very much. I will now end.